Hello everyone, uh, my name is Pam Jun Choi uh, and I'm glad to give a talk at this nice geometric analysis festival. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, the talk uh, geometric inequalities and the inverse mean curvature flow. So uh, I'm doing curvature flows like uh, inverse mean curvature flow, the mean curvature flow or the Lichy flow. And to be honest, until last year, uh, I knew these flows are used uh, in showing geometric inequalities, but haven't started in depth uh, before. Uh, but uh, as soon as I learned this, uh, I thought it's very beautiful and uh, I wanted to introduce to uh, other people. So I decided to talk about this. Okay, uh, before start, uh, let me briefly explain my outlines. Uh, so my talk is largely divided into two parts uh, and each are kind of independent to each other. So if you are interested in only one part, then uh, I'm welcome to only listen to one of them. So the first part is about geometric inequalities and it's proof using geometric flows. Uh, so first I will talk about isoparametric type inequality and then the famous Riemannian Penrose inequality and it's proved by uh, inverse mean culture flow. And finally, uh, I, uh, the, that, that this unpublished lizard of Huiskin uh, combines these two ideas uh, and show uh, isoparametric constant uh, can be used to define the mass in, in the gravitating system. Okay, in the second part, uh, this is about my result. Uh, so there are not many examples of non-convex so non compact solution before. Uh, so it's about non-compact solutions of inverse mean curvature flow under convexity assumption. So we basically shows the, uh, showed the existence of uh, non-compact convex solution for arbitrary convex hypersurfaces. So I devote the first part uh, to, to formulate the result. Uh, and the second part is another application of the main a priori estimate of this uh, existence. Uh, so uh, we could, we could uh, investigate the solution with uh, conical singularities. And then uh, if time remains, I will talk about that. How did, the, how, did, how did we get the main estimate and how did we show the existence? Uh, I will give some sketch uh, of main ideas. So we begin with the very simple isoperimetric inequality of curves in R2. So this asks the question about how much a fixed length curve, uh, say simple closed curve, uh, could contain area. So what would be the maximum area that could be contained? So the classical theorem says, uh, if my C uh, has length L, uh, then it could contain the area uh, and most L squared over four pi. And of course, uh, this inequality holds if and only if my uh, given closed embedded curve is a round circle. And as far as I know, it has many different proofs. Uh, some, uh, some proof is very elementary or uh, there's some on another like uh, modern theories as well. And it could be shown uh, for very different or very low uh, curves, say like very low curves, then you, we, we may have to use uh, geometric measure theory, but uh, we will keep the simplest version we can think. Okay. So uh, I will prove this uh, uh, using uh, the curve shortening flow. So let me, uh, introduce what this curve shortening flow is. So uh, in order to say a curve shortening flow in R2, uh, let's imagine 
a simple closed curve, which is uh, homeomorphic, diffeomorphic to S1. Then each point uh, has a curvature vector. The first point I choose uh, has the curvature vector inside. Or there's some other points uh, with outside, outward direction. And like this, uh, if this is the initial curve, uh, we can think of an evolution of this closed curve uh, by some velocity uh, at each point given by this uh, curvature vector. Then, for instance, if uh, this was given curve, uh, then later time, about some, some small time later, uh, we will see some curves like this. Because this thing, uh, this point goes outside, this thing goes inside. So it kind of make the curve uh, more round and round. So the definition, uh, precise definition is the following. Uh, it's a one parameter family of emergence, uh, but today we will only think about embeddings. So my parameter is T, uh, which goes from zero to large T, and uh, this embedding is called uh, the solution to the cup shortening flow if uh, the velocity with respect to time T uh, is equal to the curvature vector uh, at that point. So very classical theorem of gauge Hamilton uh, in 86 is if the curve started from a convex curve, uh, then you become a point in a finite time. Moreover, uh, okay, uh, the, the more important thing is it becomes uh, round. Uh, so if you start uh, from some convex curve, then as time goes, since it's convex, every point moves towards the inside. And in the finite time, it converges to some point. Moreover, when I magnify my picture around this uh, extinction time, around this point, I will see uh, my solution uh, is very looking like a round circle and it actually converges to a round circle uh, smoothly. And another important result is given by Grayson one year later uh, that even when you start from some uh, non-convex curve, if it's embedded and closed, say like this, then it becomes convex in a finite time. Then we can apply the gauge Hamilton uh, and show it converges to a point and becomes round again. So there is a nice simulation on this. Yeah, uh, let me show you. Yeah, so this simulation shows uh, how this initial complicated uh, closed curve evolves by the cup shortening flow. So as time goes, uh, yeah, it becomes convex at this point and becoming a point. Okay, so whenever you draw, yeah, you can try any simulations you want. any closed curve, uh, if it's embedded, it becomes convex and then converges to a point uh, becoming round and round. Moreover, you can even try with some embedded curves like this. Yeah, then it behaves differently. Uh, there's some, you, know, you, you could have seen some kind of singularities. 
Okay, so this explains what curve shortening flow is and what is its behavior. Uh, so we do some simple calculations. Uh, so the one I want to introduce is suppose the area uh, inside is denoted by A uh, with T. Uh, yeah, the area of curve CT uh, is A of T. Then we can compute the rate of changes of this A. And since the speed is given by K here, uh, obviously uh, the area decrease uh, in the amount uh, of this integration of K and by the gospel name, it's minus two pi. And another thing uh, is uh, let's denote uh, the length of this curve by L. Then uh, by the first variation formula. Uh, so the first variation of length uh, is given by the curvature times the speed. So you can directly compute uh, the L decreased by uh, in integration of K squared. Uh, here ds is arc length. Yeah, so it, they decrease uh, like this. So uh, here, it, they, these are for the curve case and in higher dimension. Uh, we will also use uh, this result that if, uh, suppose my MT is some M, N dimensional hypersurface and it evolves by speed S towards the inside. Yeah, so here my N is inner normal vector. Then, uh, of course, the volume uh, will decrease by this integration of S. And the area, the outside area, again, uh, if you remember the first variation of area, uh, it's given by this H multiplied by the speed S. So it's given by this, yeah. We, we will use these uh, formulas again and then again uh, in the remaining chapter, in the remaining uh, yeah, slides. Okay, so now we are ready to give a very basic proof of isoperimetric inequality. So suppose my C0 uh, is given simple closed curve and CT uh, is a solution to the curve shortening flow. And we know by the theorem of uh, Grayson and Gage Hamilton, it converges to a point uh, in a finite time. Ah, by the way, uh, you can even compute what this uh, extinction time is. Uh, since area decreased by two pi, uh, this extinction time has to be initial area over two pi. Yeah. Then uh, let me compute this so-called isoperimetric difference. We want to show uh, it's greater than zero. To show it's greater than zero, uh, let me see what it is uh, time variation. Then by our previous computation, uh, dl dt is minus integral of k squared and uh, dA dt is two pi, minus two pi, so we got this. And here, uh, from, from here to here, uh, I use the whole inequality. Then, uh, yeah, uh, we can, we, we derive immediately, it's uh, non-negative and non-positive. Uh, so it decreases moreover uh, by Grayson's theorem. Uh, first of all, it converges to a point. So A converges to zero. And at the same time, uh, yeah, since it's become, it's round, it's round. So L also becomes zero. So as these two goes to zero, we know that uh, the initial L squared minus four pi A was actually greater than zero. Okay, so that proves the inequality. Moreover, if this 
is zero, that means uh, this inequality uh, was actually equality for all time from zero to t max, then the equality of holder, ine uh, holder inequality says my k was uh, constant. That means my solution was a round circle. So that also explains about the equality case. Okay, so uh, we want to generalize this into two directions. Uh, first, uh, we want to see what happens if my ambient space is no longer a Euclidean? And we also want to know uh, how can you prove this result for higher dimensions? So let me briefly talk about the uh, non-Euclidean case of this curve uh, isoperimetric inequality of curves. So uh, if my manifold uh, has this Gaussian curvature bound, uh, upper bound K naught, then the previous proof actually can be used to show the following result. Now we have this additional term here. So it explains that uh, if uh, my space is positively curved, uh, I can even put more area. Uh, so we somehow should feel that uh, the ambient manifold uh, determines somehow the isoperimetric constant. And, and conversely, we can derive some information about the ambient manifold uh, through the isoperimetric inequality. So that will be another topic later uh, in this part of, talk, of, of the talk. Okay. Uh... And let's say something about higher dimensions. So the isoperimetric inequality for the higher dimension case can be written like this. So everything is the same. So given, uh, given outside area could contain uh, at most uh, this amount of volume and this uh, power is just to make this inequality dimensionless. And the equality just follows when uh, my omega, uh, yeah, omega is the legion and m is the boundary of omega. Uh, so the equality holds if and only if omega is a ball and m is the sphere, which is the boundary of omega. Okay. So you, you can directly compute c sub n, but I won't compute this. Uh, but uh, maybe c2, if I compute c2, the case of surfaces in R3, uh, it should be, say, uh, what is the volume of a ball that is uh, 4 pi over 3 are cute, and volume of a sphere is 4 pi r squared, 3 over 2. If you compute this, uh, you get, let's see. Yeah. Yeah. You get one over six square root of pi. Yeah, we will see this number later. Okay, now uh, suppose we try to prove similar, uh, prove by the similar technique and one natural choice of the curvature flow is the mean curvature flow. So now your surface moves inside uh, given by the mean curve speed given by the mean curvature. Then as before, we consider this quantity and the time derivative of this, uh, I, I will just skip this computation because it uses the formulas that I introduced before and the held inequality again. So we want this to be non-negative, uh, sorry, non-positive. So to do that, uh, we need this. 
first, uh, in order to say the evolution of previous quantity is non-positive, uh, we need this. Moreover, if you remember, we wanted to show that quantity converges to zero as time approaches to maximum time. That's in this second item here. If we know these two, uh, then by the same argument, we have the isoperimetric inequality. So the first inequality is so-called the Minkowski inequality. And it has a very long history. And I will talk about the second uh, condition later. So the Minkowski inequality, uh, the very basic form, uh, was solved for convex hypersurfaces uh, by Minkowski for dimension two and Alexandrov later for higher dimensions. It gives some lower bound on the integration of the curvature in terms of the area and equality happens if and only if uh, when my surface is a round sphere and uh, this is for convex hypersurfaces and uh, many people have expected the same inequality holds for other types of hypersurfaces and what's known is by uh, Penkley, Guan, and Lee in 2009, uh, they showed the, equality, the, the same inequality holds for uh, mean convex uh, star-shaped hypersurface. So mean convex means uh, mean curvature is uh, non-negative and star-shaped means, uh, as we know, there's some point so that from this point, uh, every other uh, point, uh, this shape is looking like a star. Or in other words, uh, if the position vector is H and outward normal vector is nu, uh, it's equal to, uh, equivalent to say that uh, position dot outward is greater than zero. And this, actually, this proof of this, uh, Guan and Li actually uses the mean inverse mean curvature flow. Uh, and later, uh, this was general, uh, there's another proof by Huiskin, uh, which showed uh, same inequality holds for outward minimizing hypersurfaces, outward area minimizing hypersurfaces. And I will also explain what this is uh, later. And then uh, the open question, which is, yeah, is uh, whether if this inequality holds for general mean convex hypersurfaces. And yeah, I heard this uh, very long conjecture, uh, history uh, conjecture with very long history. Okay, uh, so that explains the first part. And if you remember, uh, we need the second thing, uh, that the volume and the outside area also converges to zero. So uh, this is the theorem of Huiskin, uh, very basic theorem for the mean curvature flow. Uh, shows, uh, he showed uh, for initial convex hypersurface. So if we start from a convex hypersurface, convex compact hypersurface, uh, then as like the theorem of Gage and Hamilton, uh, the solution converges to a point uh, and it becomes round sphere. So if we combine these two, uh, Minkowski inequality and the theorem of Huiskin, then we actually, uh, this just gives the proof of isoperimetric inequality for convex hypersurfaces. But of course, convexity is very strong assumption. So um, one definitely wants to uh, generalize this. So there is one uh, problem. Uh, the problem is if we start from a non-convex hypersurface, then solution no longer exists until it becomes a point. Uh, what's 
known is if we start from this kind of the dumbbell shaped initial hypersurface like this then since the curvature at this neck is much larger uh, it shrinks fast and in a finite time uh, this neck uh, pinches uh, so your solution smooth solution no longer exists uh, after this point uh, so people have developed some uh, weak notion of solution and solved uh, this question so there's some way uh, we can generalize this to other case uh, so the next thing we will i want to talk about is the uh, result of felix church uh, a student of huiskin and is now a professor in Warwick. Uh, so uh, he, instead of using the mean curvature flow, uh, he considered uh, the speed given by a power of mean curvature. So h to the power k. And k uh, should be greater than n minus uh, one. So let, let us consider the same quantity as before. So I, I won't, I won't follow all the details, but what he observed is by using some helders, uh, given that my k is large enough, uh, then uh, given that my k is large enough, applying helder inequalities several times and then uh, obtain this inequality here. So everything is quite the same as before, but now we want to we want that uh, this is not negative. That means if this is positive, then uh, we want this is not uh, sorry. If this is non this is uh, non negative uh, non positive sorry. So what we actually need is some lower bound on this integration of h uh, to the power n. And that's uh, actually easier to prove than the lower bound of the integration of h, which is which was the mean Minkowski inequality. So that's called the Wilmore inequality. Uh, and we already know uh, that this is a little known result uh, that for immersed hypersurfaces, uh, h to the power n uh, is lower bounded by like this and the inequality again hold equality holds for long spheres if you plug in this uh, to the computation up there then uh, we immediately get uh, the all all coefficients here uh, matches perfectly and then uh, we got the monotonicity of this uh, isoparametric difference yeah, by the way, uh, the reason why it's uh, this Wilmore inequality is uh, simpler than Minkowski inequality is, uh, for instance, this integral of h to the m uh, by this comparison between I, uh, what is it, arithmetic mean and the geometric mean, uh, it's uh, greater than the integration of uh, Gaussian curvature. And that's all, uh, always equal to the area of, yeah. This is for convex case and for other case, uh, similar uh, argument uh, can be used to show such inequality. Okay, so, uh, so this thing, uh, this idea of Schurch uh, works uh, if now, if uh, this quantity converges to zero, but the flow uh, given by h to power k also has some kind of neck pinch or some, yeah, some singularities uh, which are not round. So what he actually uh, did is define some notion of weak solution. So, his weak solution is so-called level set solution. So my U now uh, is the arrival time uh, of my uh, hypersurface uh, at some point in the ambient space. So if you uh, 
uh, record uh, this kind of arrival time, uh, then this U solves this kind of uh, degenerate elliptic PDE. So whether the solution has a singularity or not, uh, we can define some weak solution of this and the weak solution is unique uh, in some dimension. And then uh, he showed uh, this kind of uh, requirement, uh, these two requirements uh, still holds uh, for the weak solution. Uh, so that proves the isoperimetric inequality uh, for more general class of hypersurfaces. Okay, so, so far we have seen how the isoperimetric inequality uh, could be shown uh, using uh, mean curvature flow or curve shortening flow. But this also suggests some ideas of how some uh, inequality could be showed uh, using uh, curvature flows. So we set up some quantity which is monotone in time. And then we investigate how this quantity converges with uh, through this flow that's this convergence can be uh, obtained by knowing uh, where my flow converges uh, so yeah we will see that uh, the same idea uh, is will be employed uh, when we use the inverse mean culture flow in showing another uh, types of inequalities okay uh, now uh, we move on to the inverse mean curvature flow. So let me first give the definition. So since we learned the mean curvature flow, uh, the definition now is more familiar. Uh, let me just tell you what is the difference. So now again, uh, my uh, I'm looking for some family of emergence or embeddings. Uh, now I'm talking about the embeddings today. And uh, now, now my speed uh, or the velocity is given by uh, one over the mean curvature. And moreover, the huge difference is previously uh, the direction is same as the direction of mean curvature vector. But now uh, direction is opposite. So my new here is the outward unit normal. Or you can think of this speed uh, as say mean curvature vector over norm of mean curvature squared whole thing minus so it exactly explains it is the uh, length one over mean curvature with the opposite direction of yeah mean curvature vector uh, yeah uh, so Let me briefly explain uh, some few observations uh, that will be very useful later. So whenever a curvature flow is defined, uh, we, sh we want to know what is the easiest possible examples of this flow. Uh, usually the easiest one is given, of course the easiest one is the, or the, the something static, uh, but another, Easiest one is given by uh, shrinking or expanding spheres. So now since my ball is uh, moving outside, uh, it's expanding sphere. So if you denote uh, the radius by R, uh, then we can make some ODE on R, say uh, the speed is equal to the inverse of mean curvature and the mean curvature is n over r. So that gives me, yeah, as I wrote here, uh, my r is given by this exponential function in time. So usually inverse mean curvature flow makes the legion inside expand 
and it becomes exponential fast. Next thing, uh, if you compute the evolution of volume form, uh, you can show that volume form uh, increase exponentially. Uh, you can do uh, first using through this using uh, first variation of area. If you remember uh, the first variation obtained by uh, multiplying the speed by the mean curvature, since the speed is one over h and mean curvature is h, uh, you get this. So it says if uh, initial uh, area is given by uh, norm of m0, uh, then later time has exact area given by uh, initial area times e to power t. So I will say this as an exponential growth of area. Another important thing is this scaling property. So if my mt is a solution. Suppose you multiply lambda, uh, it could be small number or large number, but any positive number lambda. Then your mean curvature uh, is scaled by one over lambda. Uh, so uh, you can directly see that uh, you don't need to scale in time. So this lambda times uh, m sub t is again another solution. That's very different from the mean curvature flow, uh, which is case like, uh, yeah, which follows the parabolic scaling. Okay. So I also want to uh, explain some background. Uh, so the Gerhardt and Erbas in 90s uh, showed uh, for initial strictly mean convex star-shaped hypersurface, I explained what the star shape means. The solution exists all time and it converges to a round circle after rescaling. Yeah, it, it expands, so it becomes infinitely large. But after you make this as a finite picture, then you see a round circle. And this is actually why uh, Feng Fei Guan and Li uh, showed the could show the uh, the what is it Minkowski inequality for uh, star shaped solutions. Uh, yeah, since star shaped mean convex hypersurface converges to a round circle. Yeah, and actually this flow. Uh, if we don't have star shapedness, uh, but if initial surface is just uh, strictly mean convex, compact, then it could be shown that the solution exists uh, for a short time. But uh, what we cannot expect is solution, even if it's uh, strictly, convex, uh, strictly mean convex, uh, it may not exist uh, for all time. So the counter example is if you think of some torus, uh, some symmetric torus, uh, which has very thin, uh, very uh, thin uh, leg neck, then you can make this uh, torus uh, mean convex. If you start the flow from this torus, then uh, you can see, you can show that the, after some times uh, in the inside, h becomes zero. In other words, uh, h uh, becomes, uh, so speed becomes infinite. So we may not avoid uh, singularity in this case. So I heard uh, another speaker of this uh, conference, uh, Harvey, uh, <clears throat> will talk about uh, this singularity, behavior of this singularity. So that would be, yeah, very useful in understanding uh, this kind of uh, picture. Okay, and then uh, maybe uh, the most, perhaps uh, the most uh, famous application of the mean, inverse mean curvature flow is given by uh, Huiskin and Ilmanen. 
uh, they defined a weak solution to this flow first uh, and then showed uh, the so-called Riemannian panels inequality in general relativity. So this inequality uh, tells you your uh, mass of some system uh, has lower bound given by the area of a black hole. And that use, the proof uses the uh, inverse mean curvature flow. Uh, so that's one of the main uh, topics uh, in this, uh, this time. So I will talk more about this uh, in detail.